for me, Nick is a very special co-traveler. Uh, he just reminded me I'm getting old and forgetful. We first met in 1989 in Melbourne at the Museum Education Association Conference of Australia, one of the best conferences I ever attended in Australia. And, uh, and I was surprised he remembered because <laughs> that was a long time ago. And I was invited to present how I was running a national affirmative action program for indigenous people in Australia. So what I was doing then and what Nick was doing then and what we still continue to do is a very simple formula. Uh, we still focus on collections. We, co we connect collections, communities, and connections. It's a triangulation of collections, communities, and connections. That's a triangulation. And, uh, and I remember spending four years going to the National Museum of Ethnology, Leiden, you know, working on their transformation process. My simple formula to the director general then, Dr. Stephen Engelsman was, you know, you have an opening exhibition which said the Dutch were there, so the collections are here. So you had a ribbon around the museum that we just followed to see the Dutch travels around the world. Beautifully designed. So my intervention was very simple. The Dutch were there, so the collections are here. The Dutch were there, so the people are here. So connecting collections, the local immigrant communities, and uh, it was as simple as that and the, and the collections. And uh, so sometimes these things are very simple to deal with. But before I get on with it, I just want to ask, because some people wrote to me personally saying, hey, look, uh, well, I started in Bimbetka, which is a Bimbetka World Heritage Site now, rock art site in central India. Nick is an archaeologist. What made you go for archaeology, Nick, as a young man? And from ar archaeology, you know, the travel, you know, so the, mm. could you tell us? Mm. Because there are a lot of young people listening, and it would be inspirational for them. Mm. Yes, of course. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, uh, sorry, I can't see you, but um, I, I know that you're there. I've looked at the list of participants. So uh, great that you're all attending from different parts of the world on, on different timescales. And it's uh, it's lovely to have uh, reconnected with uh, Amar again uh, recently, particularly as he's spent some time in London. So, um, yeah, how did I get into archaeology? Uh, really, it's because, <laughs> it's because of my father. Um, the, the background is that both of my parents left school at 16. Uh, and that was really because um, their families felt they needed to get out and earn a living. Uh, they're both perfectly intelligent people, but um, there was no history of going to visit museums or galleries or anything like that um, when I was a kid. Although we did go to visit old English castles, ruined down castles, which we used as sort of playgrounds more than anything else. But my father, for various reasons, liked collecting stuff. So when I was young, I would go around the secondhand shops and junk shops of Birmingham, where we, where I grew up, um, sort of trailing around with him to spend time with him. And then I kind of got interested in old things, but not not history so much as the the tangibility of old things and the way they linked to people in the past. And um, I. Uh, bought myself a metal detector, which um, if, if you've done archaeology degrees, uh, usually that's that's frowned on because they seem to be the enemy and, you know, they, they loot sites and so on. But I didn't know about archaeology, but um, so I would detect and find old coins and things in my local park. Um, but I was lucky enough to have a teacher who encouraged me to do the entrance exam for a very good school in Birmingham, which if you pass the exam, you got a free education at a very high level. Uh, and that introduced me to history. And uh, there was an archaeological society. And I got interested in that and asked a teacher, say, well, how do you go digging? Um, I didn't know, you know anything about how one went about these things. And he put me on to uh, a local man who lived in the same town as me, who uh, ran an excavation group at a Roman site uh, not too far away, which was a Roman bathhouse. So at the age of 16, when I wasn't playing sport at weekends, I would go go digging. And um, 
my father wanted me to really have a steady job and wanted me to study the law and so on. But eventually I said, no, no, I'd rather study uh, my interests. And so I decided to, I went on a couple of other digs and I, I went, decided to study archaeology at university. And, and that, so that's the simple story. Um, it stemmed from my father's interest in old things and me translating that into my own version of it. Um, but then having studied archaeology, I thought, well, how, how do I make a living? Either I spend the rest of my life, what, as I thought, kneeling down in mud, because um, perhaps rather foolishly, I, unlike some of my contemporaries, I didn't decide to study the archaeology of some nice warm place like the Mediterranean. I studied the archaeology of Northern Europe, where it was cold and wet. Um, so I thought I'm going to spend a lot of time kneeling down and you know getting wet and cold. Um, or the, the thing I was always really interested in in archaeology, uh, and by the way, I'd also been inspired by a few books that I'd had in my junior school library, which I just picked up randomly, which um, I, I realised was a, a, a sort of popular early 20th century book called God's Graves and Scholars, which was great sort of treasure hunts in ancient archaeology. So I'd had a bit of interest, but I was always, always interested in the big picture. So what did the things we found in when digging up, what do they tell us about people in the past? So I realised that I was interested in telling stories, interpreting the past, and therefore museums were a good, seemed to be a good way of doing that. So uh, I applied for the Leicester Museum Studies course then and was lucky enough to get on that. Um, and then, although this is by no means uh, necessary, um, because I liked higher education, I thought, well, rather than getting a job, I'll do a PhD. Uh, and uh, this relates to other things I'm sure we'll pick up on. My PhD ended up, uh, it's partly about archaeology and access to archaeology but it was more about why people don't visit museums. What, what are the barriers to museum visiting? And that was really because I was very conscious from an early age, as I said, that my parents, perfectly intelligent people, had had opportunities denied to them educationally and in terms of uh, cultural participation because of uh, how they'd been brought up. And um, if there's one thread running through all of my work, um, it's trying to, pro to open up access to culture, to museums, to archaeology, uh, for people who are potentially interested, but whose background uh, doesn't dispose them to participate. So that's a fairly long answer to how did I start get archaeology. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. It's uh, interesting what you said about your early uh, exposure to museums. My my early exposure was playing hide and seek in the site museum, archaeological survey, site museum and uh, museums in Andhra, because that's what as kids we did, because summer months it was so hot. But these buildings were cooler and the Chaki Dar or the security guy was always be sleeping after lunch so we could play hide and seek. That was my first experience of museums, but I didn't know they were called museums those days. And yeah. That, but now it's and uh, but uh, Nick, I, you were part of this uh, every five years. UNESCO has this uh, major forum on future of museums, and recently you spoke on it, uh, organized by UNESCO. What was really interesting is, you know, something that you know has been talked about, you know, since the 70s, is community engagement. By the end of her, when the rapporteur Lazare from the Darkra culture from UNESCO was summing up, he basically emphasized that uh, uh, it's, you know, it, it's community engagement. That's the critical one. Uh, and Alexandra Cummins, a very well known former president of ICOM, first female president of ICOM, and first. Um, president of UNESCO executive board, she was a speaker and she also emphasized that. And some of the pandemic has made people not just talk the rhetoric, but actually rethink, you know, what museum engagement, you know, community engagement is all about for museums to be relevant locally. And, uh, and, and when, I, when I came to London to that fantastic forum, 
you and Dr. Max Hepditch and Dr. Nicola Johnson organized uh, International Conference on City Museums or International Forum on City Museums. Uh, by the way, it's now become the Committee for City Museums of ICOM, one of the most mm -hmm. powerful, influential, busy committees. Um, what we enjoyed and what we learned so much was from the exhibition, Peopling of London. And people still talk about it. It had a, it had a huge effect because soon after you saw uh, Rotterdamers at the Verrell Museum in uh, Rotterdam, uh, Copenhageners at the uh, Copenhagen City Museum, uh, Canberrans in Canberra, Australia. In fact, I was the chair of the committee who encouraged Dr. Jill Waterhouse to go and meet you and Nicola and then learn about it, come back and do the you know, show for us in Canberra. But, you, you know, tell us a bit more about, it seems when people see it, you know, peopling of London, very easy, but it was, you were doing it at a time when people just didn't think about community engagement. So tell us a bit, what inspired you all of you to do it? And uh, mm. tell us a bit more about peopling of London. Uh, of course, yeah. So, so it, 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 it sort of, um there's quite a nice sequence from me being an archaeologist because um after i'd been done done the leicester course and i was sort of um doing my phd on barriers to engagement um <laughs> i was just reading the paper um uh, if any of you have done or are doing a phd you'll encounter times when you're completely fed up with the subject and bored with it and wish you'd never done it and i was kind of in one of those phases and picked up the paper and i saw a job uh, at the museum of london which i'd always admired uh, for curator of prehistory and i'd studied prehistory so i thought oh i'll apply no i'll never get it um it's the first job i applied for and absolutely to my shock and surprise i got offered the job and so I thought, well, I better take it as it's a job. You know, I've never had a job before, proper job. Um, anyway, so I, I, I started doing that. And but because of this interest in connecting with communities and making museums relevant to popular populations today, of course, prehistoric Britain, the artifacts, are, there's a lot of flints, there's a lot of bones, sort of pottery, uh, metalwork and so on. It's not obviously relevant material. But I realized that there was a time uh, when uh, at the height of the last ice age, about 15,000 years ago, when Britain was devoid of population and because the sea levels were lower because of the ice sheets on the land, Britain was also connected to the rest of Europe where the channel now is, was land. And then as the ice sheets melted, plants grew, animals walked across, people walked across following the animals to hunt them. And so about 10,000 years ago, um, Britain was populated, not for the first time actually, but that's a complex story, but an empty land was repopulated by humans. So they're all immigrants. And of course, London is founded by the Romans, an immigrant group with people from all over the Roman Empire in Roman London. Then we have the Anglo-Saxons, Normans, etc. And I realized that there was a way of telling the story of migration into London um, in a new way. And at the time, this was in the late 80s, early 90s, there was also an, an important, to me, ethical and moral issue, but it was also a political issue because the British National Party in London was gaining council seats, and one of their uh, one of the central pillars of their rhetoric was that immigration was a new post-war phenomenon in London and in the UK as a whole. It was not British. Uh, it was bringing. It was a problem, and it was bringing Britain down. Uh, and that, to me, was just simply factually incorrect. So it was an ethical, moral, and academic uh, uh, duty or an important thing to correct that false narrative by saying instead, well, we're all immigrants if you go back to when people first came in. And in fact, the London is amongst uh, some of the few cities in the world, uh, Paris is one, uh, Istanbul, well, Rome is another, 
which have had continuity and success for over 2000 years. Uh, and the reason in London's case, the reason for that continued success, uh, I would argue, uh, is because of immigration. Uh, being open and welcome uh, to the talents, skills, uh, labor, and uh, entrepreneurialism and money, therefore, that immigrants bring. So uh, we, we, we began, I began thinking about a project called the Peopling of London, which recast the history of London, uh, seeing immigration not as a, a recent unusual phenomenon, but as the very reason for uh, London's essential success as a city and something to be celebrated throughout history. So um, from that simple idea developed, um, said, well, can we, uh, when, when I pitched it to colleagues at the Museum of London, they said, that's all very good, but it's a book. You know, there's, you can't tell that with museum objects because there was still this idea that um, it's, the collection comes first and you can only, you have to you know, show the best of the collection and then form a narrative or interpret the collection. Uh, and I was saying, and I wasn't by any means the first to do this, but perhaps the first in a London museum, say, actually, you can use, you can tell museum history in a different and more inclusive way by using the objects to illustrate a narrative rather than the other way around. Uh, and so people got their heads around this and they said, well, that's all very well, but we don't have the objects in the collection to tell that story. So we had to do uh, a lot of research and what was really great was that colleagues in the Museum of London were very positive about this because they could, all of them see, actually, this is something that will unify everybody's work in the museum, not just on the curatorial side, um, but also is a really interesting, you know, have we got, it's a really interesting idea, have we got objects? And we had far more than anybody had ever realised, ranging from, um, objects that could illustrate the story of medieval, the medieval Jewish community, which had been excavated by the museum's archeological unit to much more obvious things like business cards from Huguenot weavers, uh, Jewish tailors and so on. So we did eventually realize that we could do an exhibition um, illustrated quite object rich with some, some loans from elsewhere, uh, crucial, crucial loans. Um, but also, and to come back to your community side, uh, Amar, a uh, couple of points. One is that um, uh, the, the Museum of London, like many museums then and now, still wasn't visited by anything like um, a, a, a visitorship that was representative of the population of London. And the museum, like most museums, did visitor surveys. You could compare that to the overall population. And we weren't attracting the diverse population of London. So it was mainly, as so often happens, a, a pretty white, pretty middle-class uh, visitorship. And one of the very obvious reasons for that was that the permanent galleries narrative stopped at the end of the Second World War. And there was nothing to talk about um, the, the diversity of post-war populations. And the permanent galleries themselves didn't really say much about immigration. Um, so, uh, we, we wanted to tell that more inclusive narrative and bring the story right up to the present to engage communities who were more recent arrivals, building on that long traditional history. And of course, we also wanted to uh, engage those communities in the telling of the story and also crucially in the, um, in the program. So the idea was that it wasn't just an exhibition, but it was an all encompassing project that involved a, a year long program of activities ranging from lectures and films to workshops, fashion parades, food tastings, all sorts of things. Um, uh, and a, a book, not a catalogue, but a, a book, um, an education pack and program, training programs, uh, you, you name it. It was kind of all singing and, and all dancing. Um, and as part of the, so we did an oral, uh, so the other thing, because it also involved contemporary collecting because that narrative of post-war migration was in a way seen by the museum as too recent to have been part entered into the museum collections so um although there were as i said material from uh 
uh, uh, older collections in the museum, but to tell the more recent narrative, we needed to go and collect. And that obviously involved community outreach and engagement. So we did a huge amount of talking, collaboration, consultation, collecting, a big oral history recording program to record the stories of some pre-war and some post-war migrants whose narratives would be lost as they got older. Um, and a lot of the event program was uh, run by communities themselves. So we would say to the Cypriots, you've got a week, the museum will hand it over to you, just liaise with us, but we'll let you do within reason anything you want to do. So I think there was a real feeling of um, inclusion of communities in the, the whole approach to the, to the project. And we had a mobile museum that went out around communities in London doing outreach for a year before, collecting narratives and publicizing and so on. It was a, it was a two year project that came to a fruition with the, with the exhibition. And um, yeah, I think it was important for the museum at the time because I'd been trained in contemporary museology through Leicester, and then through my PhD. And I guess I was one of the first people who had the opportunity to bring those ideas to a fairly mainstream museum. So I was lucky enough, I suppose, to be at the right place at the right time to be able to put some of those ideas in practice. Thanks, Nick. That's, that's wonderful, the way you uh, I, I, I explain. I still remember the one line from that exhibition, everybody came to London. You know, I, I think it was such a powerful line. Everybody came to London. And uh, and uh, for me, it was really important, uh, peopling of London, because uh, before Mining the Museum became famous with Fred Wilson, uh, I was brought as one of the panelists to the American Association of Museums in Baltimore. And uh, Fred and Naomi Nelson, who is, I think, in Washington, D.C. now, he asked the two of us, he was going to take, he took us around the exhibition before it opened, you know, mining the museum. And uh, he, different context, but the methodology is first, don't judge your objects, you know, open up, develop a narrative and see how you can illustrate, you know, based on what you got, rethink the object. And there are many journeys that the object makes, you know, like, like the shackles, you know, his famous shackles that he has, so you both were, for me, very seminal in the way I pushed nationally in Australia, the forum on issues and multicultural heritage management supported by prime minister and cabinet and so on. Um, everybody came to London. The one thing that I would really like you to mention about is, which impressed me a lot. And then I took it up in Australia with the Office of Multicultural Affairs we developed a package based on the kind of material you got, the school package. Uh, is the work you, you did with Rosanna Vishu with the schools. Could you tell a little bit about it? Because I think you're real, you, 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 you had a multiplier effect globally. Locally, you, you shared many things, but you actually put the roots in through the schools for, you know, for what you're doing. Could you tell us a bit about it? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, uh, as I said, I was an archaeologist specialising in prehistory, so I was <laughs> I was entering waters that I was completely uh, unqualified for. So I thought, gosh, I need a bit of kind of advice here and a bit of protection as well. And there I was, you know, a young, you know, I was still doing my PhD, I think. I know maybe I just finished it. I can't quite remember, but um, you know, naive you know, um, uh, particularly in matters of multicultural education and politics. And I was very lucky to be introduced to uh, a marvelous woman called Rosina Visram, who I still see regularly, um, who had been a, a teacher and then educational advisor for the Inner London Education Authority and had a specialism in, I suppose, um, the, the history of cultural diversity. And she'd written on a book called Ayas, Lascars and Princes about the history of uh, Asians into Britain and then expanded that into a bigger book. So she had um, massive credibility as a, an educationalist and as a historian. So she knew how to do research as well for a start. So she did a, a, a couple of things with me, well, three things really. One, she introduced me to her really wide network 
uh, because she very much believed in the project, very supportive to me. Um, so she had a, a wonderful network of academics and educationalists who were interested in anti-racist education, really. Let's name it for what it is. Um, less, you know, multicultural, yes, but actually I think now the harder edged was, you know, anti-racist education. Um, uh, she brought her research skills, so we also found her uh, some support to do more detailed research on the history of immigration in different communities and so on. And that was um, formed the bedrock a lot of a lot of our material for interpretation, for the book, uh, for schools uh, resources and, and so on. And as I say, uh, she brought her educational experience. So one of the things, um, as you might expect, that we wanted to not only educate and engage our existing audience with this important narrative. We wanted, of course, to widen the audience and uh, the uh, sort of more diverse audience to see themselves represented. And of course, an absolutely key part of that was the school's audience. Uh, the Museum of London, just like the Horniman Museum, has a very large uh, schools programme. And of course, the schools tend to be, uh, the, the, the students coming there tend to be from much wider and more diverse backgrounds than the kind of adult and family um, visitors uh, themselves. So that was an, a really important way of um, showing that the museum was open to wider narratives and wider participation. So we did a Peopling of London uh, resource pack that was, that was sponsored by uh, a, a company, a charitable foundation actually, Bearings, charitable foundation. And it consisted really of um, curriculum related, uh, highly illustrated, attractive and color resources around retelling the history of London from the point of view of cultural diversity. Uh, and it included um, narratives of individuals. So it drew on the oral history uh, fieldwork we'd been doing. Um, and uh, from memory, this is a long time ago, remember, but the, from memory, there was a, a lovely narrative of a, um, a Spanish couple who'd both been evacuated from the Spanish Civil War as children and sent to London with their coats with big labels on um, to sort of rescue them from the Civil War. Uh, a, a Jewish lady, elderly lady by then, who'd been on the kinder transport, which was a similar thing for Jewish children uh, from Nazi Germany. Uh, uh, and then a couple of, uh, somebody who'd moved um, following pa partition of, between Pakistan and India and fled because they're basically in the wrong place. Um, uh, and then uh, a somebody who'd come for work in the 50s uh, from the Caribbean. And we actually had pictures of them, transcripts, and some actual oral history tape that schools could play. Um, so, and that was made available free to all schools in London who wanted to, uh, uh, wanted to use it. And they didn't even have to come, although it was given, when schools visited the exhibition, it was given as materials uh, subsequent to the exhibition, but we also posted lots of them out to, 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 to schools that wanted uh, to, to use them. So it was a new kind of teaching resource for uh, anti-racist uh, history, I suppose. Well, thanks, Nick. I, I think you said that was such a long time ago. And uh, one of the maladies that we struggle with in present day 21st century 2021 is cultural amnesia. You know, the Australian author Clive James wrote a whole book about it, who <laughs> lives in London. And uh, uh, and people forget, you know, the kind of uh, experiments that took place, the kind of innovations that you're talking about, and uh, the sense of purpose and commitment, you know, sort of. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned about uh, people being transported, people being displaced, people coming, and so on. Um, and uh, so I'll come back to your university career, but here to Manchester, uh, you know, from Curry Mile to Oldham, you know, sort of, uh, I did all those walks with, thanks to your office organizing it for me. And uh, I mean, that, that was amazing because what, the thing is that the issues in museums, but few directors are prepared to take the bull by its horns. And I think what, what really left an impression on me is your educational exhibition on the mummy. Mm. 
and uh, on the whole question of how do we engage with human remains, not just talk about community engagement as political correctness, but actually how do we engage? And uh, well, uh, I, I found that, you know, sort of uh, both myself and all the people that came to, to the Inclusive Museum Conference, uh, very, very important, but these are turning point projects. These are turning point projects because in Museum of London, you're talking about layers of history, layers of heritage. You, you were doing the same thing, you know, layers of heritage, layers of history in Manchester. Would you talk a little bit about, uh, because was Manchester the first major museum that you directed? I think so, right? Yes, that's right, Emma. Yeah, so um, I, I did a thing, uh, so very briefly, I moved from the Museum of London to teach museum studies at UCL, University College London, but also uh, they have fantastic collections uh, uh, at UCL, which are sort of under exposed to the public, I suppose. So I got very involved with them. Uh, I did a thing called the CLAW Leadership Programme. Uh, and then building on that, got my first director job at the Manchester Museum, which is part of the University of Manchester. And um, what's, what's very interesting about the university museum sector is that it can be quite experimental. Often it's not. And to my surprise, so universities, as you know, are all about innovation, thinking new, doing new things, uh, experimenting, sometimes failing, challenging orthodoxy, you know, you develop your career by doing new things. University museums are often really strangely conservative. Um, not all of them by any means, but some are. Um, but certainly in Manchester Museum, the ethos had always been part of that university ethos of experimentation uh, and engaged academics and uh, was part of research projects to try and identify new methods of interpreting or engaging people uh, in, in heritage. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of things. I mean, uh, perhaps briefly the, well, there are a couple of things to do with human remains. Um, one was one where the, there was a, a, a bog body called Lindo Man, which is a preserved human body about 2000 years old, which was um, rescued in the 1980s, I think, from a, a bog outside Manchester. It was in the British Museum and had been displayed there fairly traditionally, uh, but we, we borrowed it um, for an exhibition which we did ourselves, which was a, quite an interesting experimental approach to human remains where um, the, the body, you couldn't see the body till the end of the exhibition. And most of the exhibition was uh, about the perspectives of six different people on the body. And it ranged, I might not be able to remember them all, but you know the perspectives were, were for example, an archeologist, so giving an archeological narrative about the body and what it tells us about Roman or late Iron Age, early Roman Britain. Uh, one was the perspective of a museum curator. So all, all fairly, you know, uh, uh, traditional, but then we had another perspective of um, a school child uh, who was in the local school when it was, uh, when the body was discovered. Uh, and they, <laughs> they, um, developed a song, which was then released as a record, which was about um, keeping Lindo Man locally and not going to the British Museum in London. So it's about a local, local community saying, this is our heritage, it's not London being so far from, from, from Manchester. Um, then there was the perspective of a Druid priestess, a, a self-declared Druid priestess, um, and her rather poetic, uh, uh, thoughts on um, what this body meant and really making the case for reburial and so on. And there were, uh, that's right, another perspective was from the um, Pete Digger driver who discovered the body and what it meant to him and so on. So it was really saying, you know, pretty obvious things, I suppose, is that there's no one way of telling the past. We all um, approach the past in a personal and individualistic way. And also what it did is it didn't privilege the academic narratives. It said, actually, if we're, if we're serious about multiple narratives, we should actually do this in practice. Um, now, I, I think it works very well as a temporary exhibition. Uh, you probably can't have six different narratives for every single object in every single gallery, but it was, a, a, again, an, an important uh, experiment about narrative 
and then uh, uh, having seen the body, um, the, the, the last bit of the exhibition was a, an interactive part, um, asking people uh, about their attitudes towards human remains. And this was and still remains, you know, a, a controversial topic to a certain extent in museums. And as you might expect, we found that, you know, there were some people who were said all human remains should go back in the ground. You know, you shouldn't have dead bodies in museums. It's disrespectful and so on. To others who were saying, I don't really care, you know, do what you like. They're dead. You can experiment with them. It's fine. And then the vast majority of people stood in the middle saying, well, when we're fine with the display of human remains, as long as it's done respectfully and it's not done in, in some sort of horror show or cabinet of curiosity style. And that also then played into our interpretation of Egyptian mummies, where we'd done some experiments with covering them up, uh, taking them off display, again, asking people uh, about what their feelings were. And uh, really, it, it just confirmed that although, you know, museums are some of the few organisations that try to be all things to all people. But of course, in matters like this, you can't, you can't please everybody because there are diametrically opposing views. But there's a kind of middle ground where um, you can, uh, you, you can probably display human remains with some degree of choice. So when we put the, when we redid, redid the ancient Egypt galleries, the mummies were displayed with slightly frosted glass on the side, and you can look into them, but they're not there, sort of all lit, uh, flood lit with um, everybody seeing them uh, straight away. So um, uh, 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 this was a few years ago now. I think um, people are, it would be interesting to perhaps hear from participants about what they think about the ethics and sensitivities around display of human remains. But yeah, Manchester was a great place to experiment. Um, we also did a lot of work on trying to widen the audiences, which I can go on to further. If uh, but, but you better let me know what you what you want to talk about next time. Yeah. yeah, Nick, I think one of the important things, in fact, uh, after after that meeting, Dr. Michael Ryan, who was then the president of ICOM Ireland, and uh, he was in Dublin at the Battery Library as a director, you know, and you said that. You, you can't be all things to all people, right? And, uh, and uh, that's a challenge when we're dealing with immigration, cultural diversity, inclusion. You know, one of the very early experiments of Australia which failed is that ethnocentric, ethno-specific exhibits, you know, is, and uh, which don't really gel well even with the immigrant communities or the refugees because their whole immigration experience becomes important. But what I liked about Manchester Museum, but also the Bitforth Gallery, because you both with the university, is that you take, you know, immigrants, displaced people, whatever, from India and Pakistan. Outside, there's a Karim Island, older, but inside the gallery and the museum, uh, you know, the exhibits for me, or based on solid research, which as you said, is one of the strengths of the university. But inclusion is not possible unless we do evidence-based research. What would you say about that? I mean, that's, I have a strong conviction about that. Evidence-based research is critical. No, totally. Uh, as I said, um, really the thread running through my uh, career has been access and um, museums are nearly always in receipt of public funding of some sort. Uh, and that public funding comes with it, uh, as far as I'm concerned, with the obligation to make um, the museum available to as wide a range of people as, as possible, including those, and this is what my PhD showed, um, uh, a lot of people are culturally excluded through education and upbringing. And they, as the French theorist Pierre Bourdieu puts it, they misrecognize that cultural exclusion as a choice. In other words, they say, I don't like museums, I choose not to go to them. But that's really a rationalization of a socially constructed exclusion. Uh, so my, my work has always been about trying to dismantle barriers because generally what we find is that people who are not familiar mu with museums, once they come in and they find how welcoming the museums are and actually there's something of interest, they say, oh yes, actually, um, but it, 
first of all, it has to be holistic. So all areas of the museum operation, even before you've even started your journey there, have got to be addressed. And crucially, um, how you approach um, access, inclusion and engagement has got to be based in evidence. So in other words, you've got to know, first of all, who your community is. So in Manchester, we took the greater Manchester population as our starting point. And so we wanted not, not every single person, but a representative range of people from greater Manchester population to feel able to visit us. And then, of course, you need to uh, do research on your visitors and who's coming now, uh, research on barriers to participation. So you need to do research on people who don't come and try to understand their attitudes and preferences and understand what might encourage them uh, to come. Uh, and you need to do a lot of qualitative research on perceptions and uh, also the experience of both visitors and, and non-visitors. So yeah, um, you, you can't get anywhere and you can't track progress without having, without having a solid research base, absolutely. Now in your current museum as a director of Honeyman New Zealand Gardens, and uh, you spoke in the UNESCO forum last month. And uh, what struck me is, you know, even though there are many models, we have to keep on experimenting because nothing is frozen in time, everything is changing. But you're in a place where I, I, I was there in 1978, you know, sort of Brixton archives, Sam Watson who founded it. And then, you know, the prison across the road, you know, sort of, uh, known for the, all the stereotypes, you know, but now you're in the heart of that, that whole area and you're looking at your, your profile in the UNESCO forum and uh, profile of your visitors and profile of your local population. You have a lot of experience in matching the two, but, but it's still a challenge, right? To deal with it now. No, absolutely. Um, so the, the Horniman Museum, for those of you who don't know it, is um, it's a really amazing and interesting museum. Um, it has internationally important collections of uh, human cultures, so anthropology with a really important, one of the world's most important musical instrument collections uh, worldwide uh, as part of that, or as a, as a sort of subset of that, as it were, um, and natural history collections as well as living collections, so butterfly house, aquarium, uh, animals and gardens as well. Um, so internationally important collections, uh, nationally funded by the government, but unlike, uh, and it's in a, a, a part of South London that is very culturally mixed, so it's not in the centre. So it's not like the British Museum or uh, the National Gallery uh, with a very strong tourist visitation. Um, the Horniman's a community museum, but with this national and international perspective that is visited again and again uh, over generations by its local community. So that's, first of all, a wonderful context in which to work. But it's also a challenge because um, when I uh, arrived three and a half years ago, the Horniman had been incredibly successful over 20 years or so and expanded its buildings and its audiences hugely. So. I mean, about 30 years ago, it had about 200,000 visitors a year. The most recent pre-pandemic year, it had nearly a million visitors a year. But 30 years ago, it was, the local community was much more mixed and they came regularly. And the profile of the museum's visitors pretty much matched that of the local population. Whereas more recently with the growth has been in a, a, a more middle-class audience. Uh, as the local area itself has gentrified, the museum moved towards a commer more commercial model, um, which was very successful, but it appealed particularly to a middle-class audience. So unlike Manchester, where we could grow the audience much larger and in doing that diversify it, uh, with the Horniman, there's a sort of huge challenge because if you've got such a huge audience, how do you diversify it? Either you stop some existing visitors from coming which is not an ideal thing to do, or you try and get another half a million coming who are more diverse to change the demographics. And we just didn't have the capacity. But we've realized more recently that the pandemic has been a completely unexpected opportunity because of course, visitors dropped right 
right off because of the coronavirus pandemic. And we're beginning to slowly build them up now. But my board just last week, Emma, agreed that we should make all efforts to take this once in a generation opportunity of the low numbers to build back a more diverse audience rather than build back an audience that's the same. And that's going to be really challenging because it requires us to really think carefully about how we can program, market, um, present ourselves digitally through social media, website, etc., uh, and how we expand our networks or build on our networks to make sure we really don't miss this opportunity. Because if we just sort of continue as we were, audiences will grow back and in about three years we'll find, oh, we've got the same audience, we're not as diverse. So we've got to absolutely seize this now and that's, that's my biggest task at the moment is to spend the next year trying to achieve that. And, and you've got a younger population, so maybe you need a Rosanna Vishram again, <laughs> you know, sort of <laughs> yeah. with local schools. And, uh, but Nick, um, some of the participants are PhD students, and a couple of them are dealing the whole question of access from the point of view of ability or disability, whatever you want to use. In your journey, you know, sort of from, uh, you know, in the last four decades, if you will, almost. And uh, have museums become, how accessible have they become to people with disabilities? They're, because visual disability is immediately addressed, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, uh, physical disability, but uh, invisible disabilities, uh, which, you know, affects a large number of people. How, what progress has been made and what challenges are there? I mean, how do yeah. you, with an open air set up, how do you deal with this? All forms yeah. of disability. Yeah. Well, I think the honest answer, Amar, is that with disability and indeed with other protected characteristics, as we call them in the UK, it's a, it's a legal uh, uh, terminology. Like many things we've discussed uh, so far, we haven't made as much progress as we should have, and as we would have wished. We, sh you know, we would have you and I would have wished to. So, uh, progress is much slower than it should be, but it ha there has been progress over the last few decades. Um, so, um, in t in t in terms of physical disabilities, yes, the the Disability Discrimination Act in the UK did force many museums to uh, make suitable provision. Um, the equalities legislation sort of has added to that and added to the range of what, as I say, what we call protected characteristics. Um, but it's very much taken the form of the very obvious things like ramps, you know, lifts, uh, physical access, um, perhaps sometimes, you know, looking at font size of labels for visually impaired people and so on. But um, it's not been as thoroughgoing and the, the sort of more hidden disabilities uh, uh, and um, areas such as autism and so on have only been addressed very, very piecemeal. So I, I certainly wouldn't claim that the Horniman or, or, or very few other museums are leading examples. So to show you the scale of the challenge, um, some 7% of visitors to the Horniman uh, declare a disability of some kind that impacts on their everyday life and uh, well over 20% of the popula local population have, have a disability. So we've got a, a long way to go. We, we do the kinds of things that many other museums do. So we, we have a, actually a very good access advisory group that meets um, quarterly uh, with people, uh, composed of people representing a range of different disabilities, and they provide really good advice to us to how to make ourselves more accessible. I think... Um, the fault, if any, if there is any, lies with us with not advancing things as quickly as possible. Sometimes, of course, there is a question of budgets, but often it's a question of attitudes. And that is something, again, as part of our widening access, it's clearly not a, just about ethnicity. It's about disabilities of different kinds. And crucially as well about socioeconomic groups or class, because that, that's actually the one area that is most difficult to change. Uh, because people are dealing with multiple issues around poverty and discrimination and deprivation. But yeah, so overall, 
better than it might have been, but frustratingly slow. Yeah. Well, I deliberately use the word disability because uh, one of my very first encounters in India was to open an exhibition uh, in the National Museum of India years ago. And he uh, used the ESAS, that means uh, if somebody cannot see, they've got four other senses, right? So how do you maximize on the senses that they have? But at the opening, the president of the National Blind Association of India, he categorically said, look, I'm blind, I know it. You don't have to be politically correct about it. Yeah. And he said people struggle more with the language of political correctness rather than try to understand. He was very clear about it. And, uh, and I, I think a lot of these, you know, like you also mentioned class, I mean, uh, moving back to India after 43 years, uh, the biggest challenge for me is uh, museums in India, basically for middle-class urban populations, largely even if the museums are located in rural areas, and uh, maybe about you know two to three percent of the population deals with museums. Seventy-three percent of the population lives in villages. These are the forgotten majority, if you will, and uh, there are huge challenges. You know, even in Denmark and Australia, there are huge issues. I mean, Denmark, uh, with their the new legislation a few years ago, closed on regional museums and all the collections went into the national collections and uh, without considering the local communities. Mm -hmm. In Australia, we had a wonderful Heritage Collections Council led by people like Margaret Anderson that you know, Dr. Anderson. And uh, we were connecting right across Australia and then with funding crisis and everything, they get sacrificed, the rural areas, the working class gets sacrificed. Uh, farming communities are left behind. I, I think this is where I love the university in Reading. They have a, a, the, the, the museum about Englishness. I, yeah. It was the curator there, Rianne, instead. I hope she's logged in. But uh, one of the beautiful labels they have is they, they have a car uh, number plate with a sticker, you know, uh, which is to the politicians in the uh, in the British Parliament, you know, saying we keep our bullshit in the paddock, you keep your bullshit in the Parliament. I thought it was a fantastic sticker in uh, yeah. how we need to deal with this kind of rhetoric and reality. But Nick, I think one major thing that people wanted me to ask you, in fact, there are two questions in there. One is you're one of the first exponents of public archaeology. Uh, in a, to a majority of listeners from knowing on this, in a lot of the countries, public archaeology is not even thought about. So how, how important, how do we actually deal with promoting public archaeology? Uh, that was my first question. Oh, it's one question, but the second part uh, from the uh, people who send me questions beforehand. The second one is, you spent a lot of your time, like you said, just before we started in universities, and yet you worked in museums. Post pandemic, as we reopen, do you see that the curricula and pedagogy of museum studies program need to be revised, rethought? Okay, so um, public archeology, span yes. Um, I deliberately, when I was at UCL at the Institute of Archaeology, I was I developed a new master's course in public archaeology, and it was, in a way, deliberately provocative because um, the phrase "public archaeology" up till then had been a United States um, archaeology phrase, which meant actually not anything to do with the public. It meant um, contract archaeology paid for uh, in order to, I suppose, discharge a public function in advance of a development. In other words, the archaeology should be recorded as a kind of public service. But it was very much about legislation, contracts, um, project management, and so on. Um, so it was about professional archaeology, actually, using public money. Whereas under uh, the great and uh, much uh, lamented Peter Rucco, who was director of the Institute of Archaeology, 
who had himself transformed archaeology by looking at it as a, a global discipline with a political dimension, not just a sort of disinterested, uh, objective academic dimension, and had prioritized or brought to the fore indigenous voices around the management of cultural heritage. Um, uh, we were very keen, both of us and, and colleagues, to um, uh, challenge this notion that archaeology was kind of between the state and its agents and property developers. Um, so public archaeology, uh, under this new thinking, became uh, a study of everything to do with the way in which the public related to archaeology. Uh, so it could be studies of metal detecting and why that engaged people. It could be people's perceptions of Stonehenge, even if they were to do with kind of aliens and astroarchaeology, um, all the myths and legends around archaeology, historiography of archaeology, stories about Great Zimbabwe, colonialism and archaeology, all of that stuff, which was um, then not an academic mainstream. Now, you know, in that subsequent sort of, gosh, you know, nearly 20 year period, I suppose it's become a subject of academic study in its own right. Um, so, um, but in terms of how we promote public archaeology, um, that's, I suppose, a subset, which is public engagement with archaeology. Um, and there it's to do, I think, because one of the reasons, as I said, I got interested in archaeology was because you don't doesn't need a lot of academic baggage by um, engaging with the physicality of a monument or a piece of pottery. There's a direct visceral engagement with people in the past. And um, my own PhD actually was about a, a, a public survey of people's attitudes to the past. And it turned out that everybody was interested in the past in some way, but many people were put off from official ways of engaging with the past, like visiting museums, um, because they felt they were not for them. But everybody had an interest in a personal relationship with the past. And as I said, in a way, my father had that. Um, uh, so that for me, the best way to promote public archaeology is through that tangible relationship with the physical remains of the past. And actually in the UK, there's been um, uh, fantastic um, success with TV series called things like Time Team and archaeology from being a complete minority subject when I was studying it uh, is now one of the more popular uh, program strands on TV. There's loads and loads of programs about archaeology now, um, particularly involving digging up, you know, new things exposed to the light for the first time in hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, so I hope, is that uh, at least a half answer on public archaeology? Yeah, that's great. That's perfect. In fact, I'm yeah. going to send this recording to vice chancellors of a few universities in Australia who are closing archaeology departments. Totally. I know it's a real shame because archaeology, even if you don't do it as a career, um, there's lots of people in unusual jobs who studied archaeology because archaeology gives you a really good grounding in a wide range of subjects, both practical and theoretical, including project management and so on. Mm -hmm. and actually, quite a lot of museum directors started off as archaeologists. And you mentioned Peter Cook. You probably don't know that uh, he was one of my mentors when he was in Canberra, because he was the principal of the Australian Institute of Aboriginal Studies or Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Studies. And uh, but th those are the listeners, participants. He was also the founder of World Archaeological Congress and a president of it, and uh, who galvanized archaeologists uh, to support the anti apartheid movement in South Africa, uh, indigenous rights globally. Uh, he was quite an inspirational person. So uh, I was very privileged to be mentored. Well, he was one of my mentors too. Yeah. So yeah. now the second half of the question, yeah. what was, yeah. Yeah. You got so talking another... about the pandemic, yeah. So yeah. museum studies program. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question, which I, to be honest, hadn't really thought about before, but I can uh, say what I think sort of on the, on the spur of, the moment. I mean, clearly the pandemic has caused um, everybody to do a lot of thinking, and um, including museums, of course. Um, so 
I'll just say a few things about museums before going on to museum studies, if I may. Um, so I think for museums, well, at least for me, speaking personally, there's a whole series of areas. Uh, one is um, to, to refresh our ideas about what museums are for. Um, and one of the things I've been saying recently is that, um, uh, you know, in times of crisis, you have to go back to your fundamental values and your fundamental purpose. And for me, museums are there for the people. Uh, and as I've said, you know, about the fact that museums should be for all. So I think it's accelerating that, uh, that community engagement and public benefit role of museums alongside the, the long-term often un under discussed long time preservation of the archive. Um, but but that fundamental thing about we're there for as wide a range of people as possible. Um, and one of the things that the pandemic really exposed, I think, was that museums, uh, at least in the West, um, had for 30 years um, embraced a model of constant growth. In other words, that um, they were in a bit of um, a bind whereby their funders expected them each year in return for the funding to deliver more visitors, more income, more collections. Rewards, if you're a museum director, were not for making the museum smaller, but for growing it, getting new buildings with new names on of philanthropists and so on. And when the pandemic stopped, you know, everything, sorry, when the pandemic came, everything stopped visitors stopped and so on. And it, it showed the vulnerability and the unsustainability of that growth model. And it particularly affect, affected the biggest and most prominent museums in the world. So Tate, for example, which I know well, um, it raises or has raised 70% of its income. So the so public funding is only 30%. And that income just all more or less stopped. Um, so what I think the the pandemic has shown, and this, this I hope would then play out in museum studies, is that um, muse a more sustainable model for museum development and progress should come into play. And that doesn't preclude growth. You know, museums have to change, uh, but it would be about sustainable growth. Uh, and I think as part of that, we've got to tackle um, the issue of uh, disposals from collections, because I did, I did a project on this again a while ago, which did lots of, you know, again, this is 15, 20 years ago, um, did lots of work on the anthropology of memory and forgetting, a brain development, how, how human memories, how human brains function by mainly forgetting most things, uh, perhaps storing them away, and pointing out museums as collective memories uh, needed also to forget by disposing of collections because museum collecting is inherently unsustainable because it keeps growing and growing and growing. Um, but again, it's, it's the reward system in museums. No museum curator gets rewarded for shrinking the collection. They get rewarded for growing the collection. So we've got to rethink all of the whole reward and value system of museums. So I would see that all as playing out in the way in which museum studies is taught. And also finally, digital. Obviously everybody has embraced digital much more. Uh, we've seen actually more museums have digital only manifestations uh, during the pandemic. And some did before, but I think more have come to the fore and more have sort of probably created a space for them as alternatives to the physical museum, which of course brings in all those usual things is, well, what is it? Everyone's always said, well, a museum, the USP is the collections. If you're a digital museum, if digital museums are a thing, where does that leave collections? And, you know, I think I'm, I'm pretty relaxed about that, actually. You know, there is, obviously, we're not going to get rid of museums with collections. I'm very happy that museums expand into the digital space much more. And people like me and probably you, Amar, are not the people to be thinking and talking about this. Uh, we need uh, a, a digital native, much younger uh, group of radicals to take on this in museum studies in particular. I think finally, the only thing I would say is that, of course, Amar and I have been talking about things that have been playing out over a long period of time. And we started out as young radicals. And I think 
I certainly am frustrated that not enough change has happened in museums. I don't see enough radicalism in museum studies and museum studies students at the moment. And I'd really, and students as a whole, I'd like students to be more radical in their thinking. Uh, we are seeing it in the decolonial space, I think, and in the um, identity politics, and that, that can sometimes be uncomfortable, but I'd like more radical thinking right across the board. I, I still remember in the 1980s, there were cartoons, you know, by a museum. Oh my God, the museum studies students are coming. You know, because <laughs> they were questioning everything about the museum. But that 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 kind of questioning is rapidly disappearing, or it's not evident. Certainly, coming back to India after all these years, uh, I, I I feel optimistic with the younger generation asking questions, but also hope that you know, sort of a country the size of India would have a national museum policy, which it doesn't have. But Nick, you started off by you know, talking about the pandemic as an opportunity. Uh, here is a statistic. Uh, NYU, Abu Dhabi, together with the Lou and all these institutions had a massive uh, conference end of last year, the 1,000 people, you know, because that's all they could allow. Uh, I could get in because I was one of the speakers. And they did polling uh, with the 1,000 people who came from all over the world. 73% poll that the pandemic is an opportunity, which none of us expected that people would think that the pandemic is an opportunity. And I think, mate, you're on the right, <laughs> you know, you, you, you're you in sync. The pandemic is an opportunity. One, one other question that I got is, uh, is you, you know, there's something like uh, 30 um, industry people in this, a registered net network of people listening to you uh, who are looking at becoming, becoming industry prepared uh, for tourism. And that's why they're listening. So whether it's public archeology span and tourism, uh, what is the relationship? Uh, how can one actually build on it for uh, tourism? Because after all, for 18 years before the pandemic, tourism became, was the biggest GDP earner in the world. And now everybody's hoping to open up. And uh, so what, what do you, with all your wisdom, Nick, what, what have you got to say about public archeology span and tourism, the relationship? Yeah. It, it's very context dependent, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I, I think often uh, uh, people are assuming we're talking about international tourism um, and uh, for, for the major archeological sites. and. It's going to take a little while, depending on where you are in the world, for that to return. And as somebody who's very worried about the climate crisis, which is something we haven't really touched on, uh, I, I'm worried about a return to normality in terms of international long haul travel. Um, and indeed, in the, U the UK itself is, is very reliant on the um, income earned from uh, the UK as a long as a, as, as a short haul and as a long haul destination. But again, to return to the pandemic, I think one of the things that is forcing every country to rethink is to the extent to which it can uh, uh, develop its domestic tourism market much more. So to give you perhaps an unusual example, I spent some time in Pakistan a few years ago, a beautiful country, beautiful country, but not, not a great image. And they are putting a lot of effort into promoting domestic tourism uh, in the sort of rising middle class of Pakistan to archaeological sites and natural, the natural beauties of the Himalaya and, and so on. So, I mean, for public archaeology, I think a more sustainable future, again, very much depending on where you are, is to think about either if you are really reliant on international tourism, how you're going to make that, um, how that's going to uh, relate to your country's uh, promise around net zero emissions and how you can think about making that a more sustainable offer. But in particular, if it's possible to stimulate domestic tourism, that's a much more obvious market and a long-term more sustainable market in all, all types of sustainability. Um, uh, and, and, and to me, th there's not a huge difference between public archeology span 
and tourism anyway, because so many heritage sites are basically archaeological sites of some sort or another, or at least they're they have an archaeological or landscape component. So the, 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 the issues to do with public archaeology are very synchronous with the issues to do with tourism, I would say. Great, Nick. The questions are coming in. Uh, one of the first questions is, you know, you've been at the forefront of this ethics of display of human remains. You talked about it. Uh, is, do you see in the near future, given the current news coverage about Benin bronzes and so on, in India, our prime minister has come back. I should say our because I'm Australian. <laughs> come back from US with 150 plus objects. Uh, I realize this is all soft power dis diplomacy, uh, but is, do you see in the near future an ethical code for return, repatriation, and restitution of human remains, or would it be contextual? Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, again, of course, uh, I hope you'll excuse me, my, my main experience is in the UK. Um, uh, but generally, I feel in the UK and, and, and most other countries that I'm aware of, there's a big difference between attitudes towards human remains and other and cultural material. So um, in the UK, the re return of human remains to indigenous communities is fairly uncontroversial. There was a bit of a battle in the 80s and 90s and where scientists were making the case that these needed to be retained for study. I think that argument has been disposed of now. So, you know, most museums that I'm aware of are very open to return of human remains to indigenous or other claimant communities. Um, now, we're now getting into, obviously, calls for restitution of cultural material. And you'll be aware, Amar, that, um, again, Australian Aboriginal groups have, have been leading this. And there have been a number of repatriation claims that have been accepted at, um, particularly, again, at university museums, which are uh, more independent, I would say, than certainly than government funded museums. So that's ha happened. Um, at the Horniman, to give you a practical example, um, we have developed, our trustees have signed off a restitution policy that's um, openly available on our website if anybody wants to look at it, uh, setting out what we mean by all these different terms and setting out a process um, if a claim is made. Uh, the process has to be triggered by an external claim. Uh, so far, we haven't had any since the policy came in and we, I don't think the Hornman's ever had any that I'm aware of. Um, we are aware that we're likely to get a claim from, for some return of some Australian Aboriginal material. Um, there's a lot of publicity about the Benin material, but again, I think uh, for most museums that has to be triggered by a claim and we'll see whether with the, all of the things that are happening in Benin City around the Legacy Restoration Trust and the building of a museum in Benin City, whether those start to happen. Uh, I think we are at a new moment around restitution where having done human remains, uh, gradually we're seeing some returns of cultural material. But again, Amar, as you know, that is not new. Cultural material has been returned since, gosh, you know, for a long time. But really interesting, because people often say, as you know, oh, well, if you return something, it'll open the floodgates. Well, material has been returned over the last possibly 100 years, certainly the last 70 years that I'm aware, in small instances, one-offs. Many of us will know the return of the Lakota ghost dance shirt from Glasgow Museums, which was done in the early 90s, possibly, um, through a public consultation. That's still the only thing that, you know, they don't open the floodgates. They're all done on a case by case basis. And I think we'll begin to see a little bit more of that. Um, in the UK, sometime, I think, either later this month or next month, Arts Council England will publish its rather delayed revised restitution guidance, which will provide guidance for the entire museum sector. And I think that will again provide a framework with which um, restitution claims. Uh, might be might be entertained. But I think universities in a different position from, say, the British Museum, which has founding legislation, which makes it more difficult. So I, I think we'll see a different picture depending on where the museum is and indeed in which country it is. Yeah, like you say, universities like today, 
uh, Jesus College, Cambridge, you know, today in the news, uh, returning a Benin sculpture. Uh, Nick, there's uh, the people from all over the world in the audience. And, uh, and I, very often, there are people from small island development states, like the Caribbean, Pacific, Indian Ocean uh, countries. I know there are people from Caribbean here, but also Mauritius and so on in our audience. The question from Trinidad and Tobago, you know, to you is, you know, where in small countries, you know, there is no what they're calling museum culture or archaeological management policy, where does one start? How does one go about it? Uh, have you got any experience of mentoring any processes like this? Uh, a, a, a little bit. I mean, not in the Caribbean itself. But um, I mean, I think, I think my advice would be um, not to necessarily start with a, a Western European model. Now, this is controversial, uh, but uh, you'll have discussed this um, lots of times, but, um, you know, the museum is essentially a Western phenomenon and it's been successfully exported to many parts of the world where there are very successful museums, which perhaps adapt that model to their own circumstances. Um, but it's not a given that every country should have a successful museum culture of the Western model. For me, it's about... Um, how best to engage the public with the past through material remains, because that's what I'm about and we're talking here, um, otherwise it's kind of history and documents and so on. Um, and it could be that you end up with something that looks rather different from a museum. It could be something that's very community led. Um, it may or may not have tangible objects. Uh, it may borrow things from people. It may or may not have a central place. It might be circulating amongst different communities, rather like Amar was talking about the, the villages in India, where there are some places where they have mobile museums. In terms of archaeological heritage management, again, Western models may say something, but I would certainly look at models for cultural heritage management which are appropriate to the cultural context in which you find yourself. Um, so it may be much more community led, for example, and community focused. Uh, but again, if it's, if it's government funded, there will need to be a government perspective and obviously all the usual led framework of legislation. But um, yeah, ask, make networks with colleagues in similar positions in different parts of the world, if possible, uh, similar scales, find, find common cause with peers and develop a peer network, I would say, and ask for help. Uh, but don't feel there's a single right way of doing it. There are lots of different ways of doing it. Thanks, Nick. Uh, my suggestion is that uh, the participant from Trinidad and Tobago uh, link up with the MAC, Museums Association of the Caribbean, which is very good at networking, it was founded by Alessandra Cummins uh, years ago. and. Uh, uh, there are a lot of resources that they can share and provide peer support. Nick, there, there's a question here. There are a lot of questions, but, you know, how does an object become a museum object? <laughs> well, um, that's a very interesting question. Um, there is no objective process, and uh, that's why... Uh, I'm interested in museum collections and disposal and how we develop them because um, I think in the past there used to be this idea that there was somehow some objective truth behind museum objects, which is why once it entered a museum it was kind of sacrosanct. But really, it's the individual choice of a particular person to propose it for acquisition and to do with their powers of persuasion to a particular group of people at a particular time. Or sometimes curators have, it certainly used to, just collect whatever they liked. So it's very much down to um, a particular individual or a small set of individuals. Um, and um, what the museum effect is, to use a sort of academic term, is to transform something by taking it out of the everyday sphere into this new sort of semi-sacred museum sphere but it's the same thing. Um, so uh, I don't think there's anything, it, it used to be a museum object with something outstanding, you know, a, 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 an outstanding world-class piece of art or sculpture or decorative arts, whatever it is now. 
Of course, museums have changed uh, to be much more community focused. So often it's an incredibly ordinary object that can become a museum object simply by um, a curator or similar person deciding it should be so. So an interesting question in parallel is, when can a museum object not become a museum object anymore? <laughs> Absolutely, that's a good one. Nick, another question, if I can try to put it very succinctly, uh, if there are three things that you think are critical for somebody to think about when they want to take up a project of a sustainable museum. Three things for us towards a sustainable museum. Yeah. Well, I mean, I suppose the the obvious one is to think about the three prongs of sustainability. It's got to be economically sustainable, otherwise it won't happen long term. Uh, it's got to be environmentally sustainable. In other words, in, ideally contribute towards the reduction of greenhouse gases, um, uh, reduce waste and pollution and improve biodiversity. Um, and equally important, it's got to be socially sustainable. And that's in a way one of the trickier ones because that's the thing that's all about engaging your audiences, the support of your visitors, um, and making sure the community values it and feels that it is theirs. And also all of the advocacy and fundraising and networking uh, that goes around that. But if you keep, keep those three things in mind, you'll have a sustainable museum. Great, Nick. And uh, in fact, for the participants, if you log on to onsustainability.com, uh, it's uh, based on the four pillars of sustainability, putting culture as the fourth pillar. Uh, it's something I founded, ran for 10 years before I picked up Inclusive Museum Moment founded in Johannesburg, there are nearly 1,500 well-researched and uh, refereed papers. It's a tier one journal on sustainability.com. Now, Nick, we have museum studies programs and you would know them. We, we both know quite a few. Uh, is there any, you know, the question is curating archeological site museums. It requires particular type of skills and competencies. Are there any museum studies programs that deal with site museums? Well, um, not that I'm aware of, but that might be because I'm not fully up to date. Um, certainly when I was at the Institute of Archaeology, uh, we did talk about archaeological site museums in a combination of sessions on public archaeology and museum studies. But um, I think also because it's quite a, a niche subject, um, I don't think any university so far has felt there's enough students that would make a course dedicated to that um, viable economically and, uh, and academically. So I think if you're interested in archaeological site museums, you'll probably have to do a, a, a combination of training in museums, cultural heritage management, public archaeology, and indeed archaeology itself. Um, uh, and of course, within that, there's lots of different types of archaeological site museums as well. Some have collections on site, uh, others don't because the material has gone to some other more central museum. And you're talking about, you know, a site interpretation and a site interpretation centre. So, uh, yeah, it's a really interesting area that I think is uh, deserves more study and critical engagement. But I can't think of a, a one sh one. Sh one stop shop at the moment. <laughs> One last question, Nick, because we're running out of time. And, um, and I know who is asking this question. It's, uh, you know, we, 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 we're rethinking a lot of conce concepts and conceptual frameworks. The question is, in case of illicit transfer of museum objects, uh, how appropriate is the term appropriation? Is it correct to say that such transfer leads to cultural appropriation? So does the illicit transfer of cultural objects lead to cultural appropriation? Yeah. Um, well, I would say it does. Uh, I may be looking at this rather simplistically uh, because, um, I, I mean, sometimes the legal, legal acquisition uh, of 
cultural objects can also be deemed to be cultural appropriation if it's not displayed sensitively uh, with uh, due acknowledgement from its origin. So that, that's an issue in UK museums around the colonial context of collecting, which in legal terms was not always, but usually done legally. But certainly there are issues around cultural appropriation now. So uh, if that's the case when items have been acquired legally in the past, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the illicit uh, acquisition is an extreme form of a cultural appropriation through theft uh, and should be, you know, should be remedied by, by legal means. Yeah, thank you, Nick. I mean, in fact, I started off with uh, Douglas Barrett in the British Museum in 77, 78, recatalog recataloging the old Amarathi Buddhist sculptures. It's the largest early Buddhist collection in the world, which the British Museum has. And the entire collection comes from 26 meters from where I was born in Amravati. And, and I was showing some of these images and one of the retired Telugu teachers, professors, he said, that is cultural appropriation. Then we started a whole debate. This is in a village, by the way, in Telugu, the local language, which none of the people deal with the Amravati sculptures in the British Museum know the language. And uh, what it came about is that where the appropriation has taken place is they removed them, uh, you know, they, they were all removed or dug up, you know, so not excavated as people assume in the 19th century. And uh, but how they are presented is within a Western hegemonic aesthetic. Yeah. Now, that presentation is a process of appropriation. That's what this is village people, you know, retired school teachers and others. And I think that's a very nice question. And also a bit personal for me, we started with your personal <laughs> life. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nariman. 